welcome to Leading Entrepreneurs of the World Conference uh, 2022. We're wrapping up here our first day, so we've got we've got our anchor speaker here to, to close out to close out our Monday as we move into as we move into the, the rest of the week. We're uh, happily joined today by Tara Spaulding. Tara is the managing director of Boom Startup Accelerator, and Tara is going to speak to us about simplifying investor relationships. So we look forward to Tara's presentation. Tara, let me hand it off over to you, and I will join you on the back the back end. Okay. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here. Hello, I'm Tara Spaulding, and as mentioned, I'm the managing director of Boom Startup Accelerator. It's my pleasure to share with you my tips and tricks on how to simplify investor relationships. If you have any questions, please connect with me after the event, and I'm happy, of course, to answer them. Boom Startup Accelerator is the most inclusive accelerator in the world. Our format is open and opt-in because we focus on educating founders about financial and funding matters. And then we track their progress through our platform and analyze each business. And by, based on what we learned, we make recommendations on courses, webinars, mentors, and tools that would be helpful. Our community is full of first-time founders who like to do it themselves and appreciate guidance from experts on important aspects on how to grow their business. Boom Startups curriculum follows five stages of startup growth, viability preparation, entity formation are the first two stages, and then there are investment plan, investor pitch, and of course, funding, most importantly, post-close activity. These three we're going to really focus on today on our topics for simplifying investor relations. And basically, these are very important because they tightly align with each other and also how you want to grow your company and more importantly, exit your company. Because we're the most inclusive accelerator in the world, in 2021, we worked with over 1,000 startups from around the world. They participated in our programs, they worked with our mentors, leveraged our online tools and training modules. Uh, Boom Startup gave these companies uh, support by helping them solve very big problems across several different industries using different business models to make a big difference in our world. We measure success by educating founders and connecting them with helpful excerpts. Boom Startup provides learning opportunities and mentoring that assist first-time founders with business maturity guidance, investment preparation, capital structuring, and investment strategies. Our four programs are designed to help first-time uh, entrepreneurs and CEOs understand what it takes to run a successful business. We have a pitch competition called Pitch Up. Then we host one-hour sessions called Open Up. These are webinars and online courses. Rise Up are intensive week-long sprints supported by mentor services. And of course, we have Amplify Up, which is our funding program. Amplify Up helps high growth potential companies get prepared for equity-based funding, which we're gonna talk about today. It's about a 12 week long program culminated in a demo day where private investors can meet and see investment opportunities vetted by Boom Startup. If you're an entrepreneur who wants to begin this process, complete Boom Startup's quarterly business survey. It's that simple. If you're an investor who wants to listen in to our vetted companies, and pitch at demo day, contact me and we'll invite you into these programs. Now, to simplify investor relations, it's important to maximize the intention at each pivotal moment, depending on where your company is relative to fundraising. To me, there are three distinct points. First, before funding begins. Next is negotiating the round and the terms. And third is after the round closes. Of course, investor relations are important on this, but you can't let them get away. So it's important to drill into each of these and work as professional and as efficiently as possible. Now let's start with before fundraising. This step will make the most time and it will take the most work because it isn't done right in the beginning, then you won't need to worry about investor relations going forward. The biggest thing to remember before fundraising is that you need to be thinking about uh, not about yourself, but actually about the investor. <clears throat> Boom Startup talks about being empathetic to your investor, especially if they are angel or not driven by an investment fund. If you feel their pain, 
on what they're trying to do with their investments and understand their investment strategies, just like how you feel the pain of your customers, by deeply caring to resolve an investor's needs will help you drive a solution based on appreciation. And that often is the secret to success. So our first rule of fundraising is taught by one of the wisest characters from distant world long, long time ago, Yoda himself. There is no try, there is only do or do not. When you begin this process, do not start by talking to investors unless you are actively ready to fundraise. This includes investors who reach out to you while you're in the preparation process. If you don't start when you want to start and you start prematurely, it can catch you off guard. You can get bad information out there and you can quickly learn and lose their trust. Remember, in fundraising, you want to remain in control of this process. And that's by having all of your ducks in a row. And it takes a whole bunch to prepare. What is preparing? You're not preparing for capital. You're actually preparing for new owners in your company. And by preparing for those new owners, that helps you prepare to close the round. Things such as your business entity and the documentation, your financials, your taxes, all of your agreements, the market data, your endorsements, the references, as well as who have you reached out to from investors and tracking those connections and communications and expectations. Of course, all of this is gonna be managed in your deal room, which will be constantly being updated and evolving. Plus, of course, preparing for the new owners, it's the terms of that ownership agreement or your term sheet, plus the proper SEC filing. And of course, the IP, the sales and the marketing. It takes a lot to prepare. And this is before fundraising, get all of these done and done well and professionally so that you don't have any sort of hesitancy on onboarding. Next is another one of my favorite sayings from the 80s, which is I love it when a plan comes together. And this is from Hannibal Smith from the A-Team. He never went in and fought a battle or <laughs> uh, basically escaped a dangerous situation without he having the right resources and the right plan in place. Of course, there were some interesting aspects where they would wing it with their van, but let me tell you, they knew exactly what they're doing and they played to their strengths. So what is this? And before fundraising, come up with a fundraising plan, put a time, put a use of funds and know exactly the type of investor that would have the appetite for what you're asking and the sorts of returns and outcomes. Again, you're appealing to owners. <clears throat> the worst thing to do is just what we call spray and play, pray. And, and spray and pray means you're sending out bulk emails saying, hello, are you investing? Would you be interested in looking at my deal without having any sort of relationship or connection or again, back to the point of empathy for the investor. Don't do this. It's a terrible mistake and it ruins the sort of trust in forward looking relationship. So how do you fix this? How do you not spring prey? Well, it's very simple. Curate and engage at relatively the same time. So just like what we learn um, from Ford himself, the assembly line is the best, and you can do so with accruing investors before even beginning to fundraise. First off, review your network and your sphere of influence and start collecting potential investor names and start figuring out what is the ideal profile outside of the money? What kind of owners do you want aligned in your business? Additionally, don't do uh, fake or forced outreach. Make it as natural as possible. And so again, it, it doesn't go back to hello, are you investing? It's establishing a sort of connection based on similarities or experiences and creating those sorts of relationships. Again, you want it as natural and organic as possible. Next, establish trust. Um, of course, asking for money should be the last step so what can you do beforehand to offer the investor support? What are they working on? How can you give them insight into the industry that you're participating on? 
There are so many different opportunities that you can do to establish trust. And of course, screen and engage these investors before, of course, inviting them into the investment consideration because you want a tight match. The other thing about before you start fundraising is making sure that the market timing is right because timing is, of course, everything. And if you're too early, uh, you're not going to catch the wave. If you're too late, you're going to curl like this poor gentleman who doesn't have a leash on his board. There are aspects in the market, especially today's market, that you just can't control, such as the investor's mindset around early investment rounds or their actual cash situation because cash might just be depleting or promised to other investment needs. Additionally, you're pitching and asking for investment against other startups as well. So without even knowing who you're competing against, you certainly are competing. And of course, investors have different due diligence experience. Again, go back to that deal room, make sure everything's in it, because you will be asked to curveball. And if you are prepared, it helps you. Of course, there's emergency situations that may take the cash from the investment off the table. And also, there might be surprise investor pairings, such as an investor won't go in without other investors by their sides. These are situations that you can't control, but if you're prepared, it can help you to navigate around it. So the secret about um, preparing to fundraise is to launch it as a race. Put a time around it. Make your term sheets ready to go, or at least the investment parameters, so you understand what you're giving up to the new owners of your company and what you're getting out of it. There are three different paradigms that we have. And if you're in the upper 1%, and guess what? You get to do the horse race where all of the investors get to race around the track one time as fast as they can with the best term sheet. But in today's market conditions, with valuation softening, we're going to see less and less horse races. More often or not, those who are attending this session are more likely going to be on the dog race, which means you soft seed a lead investor with certain dog term, with certain investment terms. And then you release it to a certain other similar profile investor group to see what other dogs want to be in the race to meet those terms. Now, if that doesn't work, the last in resort is the poker game, which is you have one other investor at the table and you're holding the chips. And you're going to have to figure out when you're going to fold or when you're going to double down because you do not want to push or lose this investor. If you lose at the poker race, guess what? You've lost your investment opportunity and you need to reset and restructure your terms and look at and look for different investor groups. Step two is negotiating the round. Let's say you close the dog race or the poker game. So now what? How do you simplify the investor relations? Well, bad news, investors deal attention span is probably more like a very scary roller coaster for you where they may be calling and texting you every three minutes, asking additional follow on questions, but then they can go silent for a day, a week, or even more. And this is absolutely gonzo crazy, especially for entrepreneurs who just don't know what to expect. So the secret is don't lose control over it and have, again, a game plan as to why you need the funding and what is the sort of funding backstop. One of the funding backstops, that's a secret, is to leverage an SPV for investor term sheet negotiations. What's an SPV? An SPV stands for Special Purpose Vehicles, and it's a business entity that's created for a specific purpose to create the assets, which is your company, and to isolate it from the liabilities, which are the investors. SPVs are operated and organized by a separate entity. So uh, groups such as myself, Boom Startup Accelerator, can be an SPV organizer for you. What SPVs do is it allows investors to pull their funds so they can write smaller checks, but the amount of the check, um, total amount that gets invested still hits what you need. And the capital is called up front. So if they are in the SPV, then it 100% will be funded to you. Additional SPVs remove audit and financial statement obligations 
and allows unique waterfall or payout provisions. And it also allows organizers such as Boom Startup Accelerator or other entities to carry interest, management fees, et cetera. So be privy to how the SPV is being set up and who exactly is getting paid out and when for the work. Also, SPVs are good for you because as an entrepreneur, it handles the regulatory requirements for KYC AML or basically your accredited investors. It also handles wonderful things that become very labor and expense intensive, such as taxes, K1s, investment transfers, distributions, and shutdowns. You can always have a blend of direct investor management and indirect investor management, but our recommendations is that more often or not in downturning uh, markets such as what we have today, you can often collect more smaller checks but you uh, also can remain and receive large direct investment checks, but it may not be as many as you want. So by blending the two of direct investment and indirect investment and leveraging an organizer such as Boom Startup to handle the smaller checks really does alleviate the amount of work and attention that you have to do because the SPV standardizes the um, term sheet, etc., which certainly simplifies your investor relations. So how do SPVs work? Well, it collects cash from each of the investors who invest into the SPV. The SPV itself it becomes a business entity. It manages its own taxes, and it's in fact isolated from your company that you have nothing to do with. But the SPV itself signs your security. So is it a convertible note, a price round? Doesn't make a difference. That in itself signs the term sheet dated and in fact is what is handed into the SEC. The term sheet will give the cash of four securities or basically um, a line item on the cap table. Again, it reduces the investor engagement and reduces the investor risk exposure by putting things through SPVs. We have SPVs with a single investor in it, so it doesn't even have to have multiple investors because this reduction of risk is very, very important, especially in today's market. And lastly, it simplifies the cap table so you can basically collapse 99 investors, which would have been 99 lines on your cap table into one. SPVs can help companies attract investors to invest in funds to receive investors because the SPV is used as an investment vehicle for investors and pools of money. That sum of money is then used to invest into the parent company or into your company once the SPV is closed. The SPV remains dormant and when you sell your company and there is a distribution, the SPV opens back up and then distributes the, um, the distribution to each of the owners of the SPV. When to use SPVs? Before you close a round. I've been asked several times, now that I have all these investors, can we collapse them? Because I have too many rows on my cap table. The answer is no, we can't. If you do, it's extremely expensive and problematic. So the best way to do it, the most efficient way to do it is in the beginning to set that expectations to manage your smaller check investors through an SPV. Separately, SPVs limit the rights on an investment round and people who sign the SPV all sign a standardized term sheet. Yes, the term sheet can have participating preferred shares, etc. But it's standardized for every single investor on there. Also, SPVs help satisfy investment minimum rounds. For example, if you have an investment minimum round of 250k but you have a lot of other angel investors or angel groups that can write $50,000 checks, you can collect and consolidate five of those $50,000 checks so that the SPV hits the $250,000 minimum. And no one knows that there are many little checks when they look at your cap table to make that quarter million dollar investment. Now, the third part is after the round closes, what do you need to do? The rule of thumb on this is the lack of communications destroy relationships. We know this in life. By keeping honest and open and consistent communications about points of matter that you know that your investors care about, again, going back to your before fundraising stage, this is absolutely important. 
what do investors care about? One, where did their money go to? Two, how is the company going, good or bad or ugly? And three, what does the new set of outcomes look like? And aspects can be, are you still in the same trajectory for exits? Are you on the same trajectory for innovation? Still in the same trajectory or not for our customers? Investors are owners of your company. Only a small portion, about 30% of what they can bring to you as an owner of your company is the money itself. The remaining part should equally be paid attention to, and that's how come consistent communications are so important. First and foremost, investors have very strong networks. Oftentimes, they've already succeeded in the industry you're upon in participating in, and they have networks and insight into your industry, into your business model that can in fact help and support your growth. Even if they participate in SPVs by putting out updates and questions and activities to them on a periodic basis, your investor wants to see you succeed. That is why they put in money. So keep these sorts of communication going, especially if you need to hire, People, if you need to find channel support or sales support, or you're thinking about launching in new markets, your existing investor base can be wonderful resources that want to make sure you succeed. That's why they give you money in the first place. Separately, your investors can also provide expertise and advice. Yes, it can actually be on your board of director, which is the obvious, but the unobvious can be that they can help distribute or test products, and they can help find prospective customers or uh, regulatory situations or other sort of supports that's very important. And additionally, you never just fund once, you fund multiple times. Don't belittle the opportunity that investors work with other investors. And if you show traction and growth and you continue that sort of trust in communications, they can bring to you in future investors for future rounds. And that too is extremely important. So consistent communications drive trust. Make sure that you're doing communications at least on an annual basis, if not on a quarterly basis. And make sure that you communicate their position on the cap table and any sort of important cap table updates, especially if they're on your board. <clears throat> Also, please communicate to them any sort of equity or debt based plans that you have before signing, because if they are taken by surprise or didn't have the ability to contribute or participate, this could really frustrate and burn the sort of trust that you built. Also, be consistent in communicating updates with innovation. Anybody that's invested in you is already under NDA because they want to see you succeed and they're betting on you for a very fruitful outcome. Uh, by not giving innovation updates or plans on what the product roadmap is going to be, for example, uh, maybe a missed opportunity to get uh, accelerate that sort of path. And of course, additional resources are important, not only for higher positions, but recently hired positions are, are very helpful, as well as land and massive, uh, large asset acquisitions. And of course, exits. Uh, all investors want to be repaid and they want to be repaid back significantly. So not only are you communicating the return on their investment, but if there's any sort of changes, and that includes the good, the bad, and the ugly, certainly communicate that. And with that, I would like to close. Um, if you'd like any more information about Boom Startup, again, it's everything is online, we're inclusive, and our promise is to guide you um, with care and encouragement, and happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Very, uh, very informative. So a, lot, lot, a, lot for, a lot for entrepreneurs to take in, a lot for them to consider as well. Uh, I especially liked your pie chart there at the end, which kind of underscores that it's the money. While the money, while the money is important, it, it's not uh, it's not the be all and end all of it. And that almost two thirds of what they have actually the expertise and connections that they can bring really comes beyond just writing the check. 
You know, Glenn, I can't agree with you more. I um, really get frustrated with the show Shark Tank, and it's because of what the editors do to it. The reason why is Shark Tank is so focused around on the editing. You know, what is the amount raised for a percent of ownership? And like, that's when it gets the most intense notes and, and you know, soundtrack, et cetera, and exciting cuts back and forth. But I think the most important thing that never is emphasized enough is each of those sharks have ran insanely successful companies and still have very active and lucrative networks that they can in fact invest in and then pull the company into. And so when each of those investors are speaking, it's really a lot more than the percent of ownership. It's the path to success and the path to exit by merging them into a well-regarded investors network. Oh, it's, the, it's the exponential side of it that comes with it, right? For, Absolutely. For sure. Well, you know, and any kind of investor efforts, whether you're an entrepreneurial company going through funding, whether you're a public company, it's all about open communications, transparency, honesty, and, and you mentioned it uh, in, in, in your uh, almost your closing remarks. You don't want any surprises. No. You don't. You don't want somebody to come back and say, "Wait a minute, you didn't. You didn't tell me that. That I didn't know that was going to be part of part of the uh, the path or the plan." Yes. And then and then you lose that you lose that confidence, which is, you know, which is always from from a business standpoint, you know, one of those types of things that are hard to come back from, for sure. Yeah. How, yeah. how how on, on, on your special purpose vehicle? That that's an interesting piece there. How how prevalent has that been in in your practice of late? Very very successful. Um, three quarters of the companies that graduate Boom Startup have used special purpose vehicles. And statistically speaking, they pull in twice the amount of cash, especially the pre-seed round, than those who receive direct funding. And that wasn't based on our 2021 data. I suspect uh, 2022, the SPVs are increasing because we're seeing especially angel investments now writing smaller checks, but they still want to diversify their investment even though they're not putting in as much because they just don't have that capital available. But by the SPVs, you can collapse. Well, SPVs can handle 99 investors in a single SPV. And so it's it's like, you know, if you want to think about it, it's 99, $10,000 checks. It's, it can be the entire round itself. Yeah, it's certainly, a, it's certainly a, a great way to clean up the cap table, tighten it up, not have people get nervous like, <laughs> Look at, yeah. look at all these names. <laughs> well, more importantly, you know, it's assuring to the investor that there's a sophistication on the entrepreneur side. Uh, because oftentimes entrepreneurs can't handle the sort of minutia when it comes to collecting the check and getting all those sign offs. So it's actually it's a form of sophistication to just expedite that process. And as we know, earlier the earlier stage the companies are, the quicker they need the cash. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. As you as you move as you move through the life cycle of of, of the entrepreneurial venture, clear, clearly that becomes really important, and the speed and the and the speed the speed to get it done as well. Well, it, so, it sounds like you guys have a tremendous business here. You're you're doing some great work in the space. So uh, we wanted to thank you for joining us today and, and sharing all of your wisdom. And uh, I think you said tips and tricks <laughs> early on. Uh, so they were very helpful. I'm sure our audience will benefit from it. Uh, obviously, I think you shared your contact data. You have you have the website out there if people if people need to get get a hold of you guys. Uh, yep. And we wish we wish you continued success and and much uh, and, and thank you for joining us today. Um, leading on to the news of the world conference. So you're a great capstone here for our our ending of the first day. Tremendous job. Um, thanks for all, for all your help, and we look forward to seeing you in the future, Tara. Best of luck. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take care.